Perhaps just for today, you will allow me to smoke immediately. When the New Yorker sent me to report on the trial of Adolf Eichmann, I assumed that the courtroom had only one interest, to fulfill the demands of justice. <laughs> this was not a simple task, because the court that tried Eichmann was confronted with a crime it could not find in the law books, and the criminal whose like was unknown in any court prior to the Nuremberg trials. But still, the court had to define Eichmann as a man on trial for his deeds. There was no system on trial. No history, no ism, not even anti-Semitism, but only a person. The trouble with a Nazi criminal like Eichmann, was that he insisted on renouncing all personal qualities, as if there was nobody left to be either punished or forgiven. He protested time and again, contrary to the prosecution's assertions, that he had never done anything out of his own initiative, that he had no intentions whatsoever, good or bad that he had only obeyed orders. This typical Nazi play makes it clear that the greatest evil in the world is the evil committed by nobodies. Evil committed by men without motive, without convictions, without wicked hearts or demonic wills, by human beings who refuse to be persons. And it is this phenomenon that I have called the banality of evil. Miss Aron, you're avoiding the most important part of the controversy. You claim that less Jews would have died if their leaders hadn't cooperated. This issue came up in the trial. I reported on it, and I had to clarify the role of those Jewish leaders who participated directly in Eichmann's activities. You blamed the Jewish people for their own destruction. I never blamed the Jewish people. Resistance was impossible. But perhaps there is something in between resistance and cooperation. And only in that sense do I say that maybe some of the Jewish leaders might have behaved differently. It is profoundly important to ask these questions because the role of the Jewish leaders gives the most striking insight into the totality of the moral collapse that the Nazis caused in respectable European society. And not only in Germany, but in almost all countries. Not only among the persecutors, but also among the victims. Yes. The persecution was aimed at the Jews. Why do you describe Eichmann's offenses as crimes against humanity? Because Jews are human. The very status the Nazis try to deny them. A crime against them is, by definition, a crime against humanity. I am, of course, as you know, a Jew. And I've been attacked for being a self-hating Jew who defends Nazis and scorns her own people. This is not an argument. That is a character assassination. I wrote no defense of Eichmann, but I did try to reconcile the shocking mediocrity of the man with his staggering deeds. 
Trying to understand is not the same as forgiveness. I see it as my responsibility to understand. It is the responsibility of anyone who dares to put pen to paper on this subject. Since Socrates and Plato we usually call thinking to be engaged in that silent dialogue between me and myself. In refusing to be a person, Eichmann utterly surrendered that single most defining human quality, that of being able to think. And consequently, he was no longer capable of making moral judgments. This inability to think created the possibility for many ordinary men to commit evil deeds on a gigantic scale, the like of which one had never seen before. It is true. I have considered these questions in a philosophical way. The manifestation of the wind of thought is not knowledge, but the ability to tell right from wrong, beautiful from ugly. And I hope that thinking gives people the strength to prevent catastrophes in these rare moments when the chips are down. Thank you. <laughs>